Hello everybody, I'm back. We were off the air for a couple of weeks because my husband has been on a trip, but here we are again. So I hope you'll find me online and, and tune in. It's Friday, August 12th. I didn't even need any help with that date. Friday, August 12th. So I had said we were going to do one more lesson on, the, uh, on faith speak, learning how to speak words of faith and what effect that can have on your life. But you know, I listened to the last lesson up online, I think it's number four, to see what I might wanna add to that to wind it up, and I thought, I don't think I wanna add anything. I think it's a pretty complete little lesson. And I could talk for another half hour, I have no problem with that at all, but I don't think it would add really enough content. So we're gonna leave it as it is. If you're tuning in for the first time and you haven't seen that study, I hope you'll go back and pick it up. I think it's important. Um, okay, so today we're starting something new. I have been saying for a couple of years that I wanted to do a Bible study on the phrase, but God. Well, I've decided this is our time. It, when we get going in the fall and most of you come back and we're, we start brand new for the new year, um, it'll be, we'll, go, we'll go back to a book study because I think that is the most important and that's always our default. We're usually in a book study. But this summer it's been kind of refreshing to just have little thematic devotional Bible studies on things that don't necessarily come up in a book study. So we just finished The Power of Words, learning how to have your, your words match your faith and the power that can result for, from that. And now we're starting one on the phrase, but God. You know, you can see my little plaque here I got from a friend. The reason I got this from her was because she knew that I liked that phrase and I talk about it a lot, but you know, I'd never actually studied it. And what a difference it has made in my life and faith already. We've had a couple lessons now on Wednesday mornings and now we're starting here on Fridays, but I hope that you'll get out of it even half as much as I'm getting out of it myself. It's one thing, as I've told you so many times, to have these Christian principles and concepts kind of just generally living in our hearts and swirling in our minds and giving us this kind of general warm, fuzzy faith. You know, better than no faith at all. But my goodness, the, the stability, the power, the, the, the new life that can come into a, your walk with God when you actually study these things out in the Word and can plant your feet firmly on them. It's a wonderful thing. So today we start, but God. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. It's a familiar story, Noah and the ark, and I'm not going to go over all of the, the history because we really just want to look at that, that spot where everything turns in each one of these examples with the phrase, but God. Um, I'm just going to read, let's see, I'm gonna read verses of chapter seven, verse 11 and verse 12, 19, 20 and 24. I'm gonna read four verses, okay? Dan will have them written underneath. In the 600th year, year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. That's about 20, between 22 and 25 feet higher than the highest mountain top. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Now, what does this have to do with but God? Oh, it's a good one. It's just a fascinating one and it's a powerful one. Then verse 1 of chapter 8 says, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark and God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. Well, we're going to look at this. First of all, to really understand this, you've got to put yourself in Noah's place. Remember, these were real people. This was a real historical event. These were real lives. And he thought and felt much like you and I. And what would it be like? What would it be like to be floating over the earth in a barn 
with just your few family members, they were a small group and all these animals, nothing but water. There was no earth. There wasn't even a mountaintop. The entire planet was underwater. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know when this would end. He didn't know where it would end. He didn't know what the new world underneath was going to look like or what his life was going to look like or where any of this was going. Think about that for a minute. Um, that's kind of a scary situation. All he could do was the duties each day that God had given him. Just, oh, what a salvation in life that is. This is a little digression from my plan. But just do the duty that lies nearest. And you've got it made. You don't have to wonder, what does God want me to do? If he has some big, huge change for your life, he will find a way to communicate that to you. Doors will open, doors will close. In the meantime, just get up, dress up, show up. Do the duty that lies nearest. So that's all Noah could do. And uh, it must have been a frightening situation. But God. But God remembered Noah, sent a wind, got the waters all dried up, and started Noah's brand new life in a lovely spot. Now, there's the word remembered it used to bother me because I think, well, had God forgotten Noah for a while or, or what does that really mean? Well, it's a fascinating word and it, it means marked. God marked the day. God marked this event in Noah's life. It was on his calendar. And when it came up in the calendar in the perfect fullness of time in God's plan for this whole event, he acted in Noah's life and he sent that wind and the new, the new path began. That's what remembered means. It means to mark something. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the same Hebrew word. It doesn't mean um, if you have forgotten about it, remember that you know there is one day that's holy unto the Lord. It means mark it to observe it. And that's what it meant here too. God had marked that day in Noah's life to observe it, to act in on behalf of Noah. Well, I thought about my own life and I thought about the times, I'm gonna look at my notes. I thought about the times and there have been some when I have not been able to tell, you know, where a situation is going. I have absolutely no control. I can't see the end from the beginning. The future is 100% unknown, and it doesn't look to me like any dominoes are in place. And it can be kind of scary. I'm not going to go into to details of what was, you know, what happens in my life or where I was living or who I was dealing with or anything like that. You've got your own stories. But there are times in life when we're at sea. That's, that's the phrase that's actually used. I'm all at sea. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know when this will end. And I have no control. Well, what should we say at that time? But God, but God does know, but God has engineered the entire event, but God has a plan, but God is in charge, but God will open and close the doors before me as I walk and lead me to a wonderful place in the fullness of time. All we need to know is, but God. We don't have to know the end from the beginning. Sometimes I'm thankful I don't. We don't have to have complete control over our own lives or the lives of other people around us. I'm glad I don't. But God does. God is on the throne and he has promised to take us through to a good place. So when next time you're feeling like that, all at sea and you don't know the end from the beginning and life is a little bit scary and confusing, and you don't know where this is going to end, and you feel like you've lost control, go, yay, now it's time for God. But God, but God does know, and God will remember me. He will act in my life at the right time. It's a wonderful thing. The next one we're going to look at is Genesis 31. Genesis 31. This is now the life of Jacob. And... Jacob, the context here, Jacob, with his wives and his entourage and everything he had accumulated in 20 years of working for, his, for Laban, 
um, is fleeing. He finally is getting out of Dodge because Laban has not allowed him to leave for 20 years. And it's just an interesting instance of but God. There are two of but gods here we're going to look at, and it's wonderful. Um, let's see, verse 42 is going to be the verse we're actually going to focus in on. But I'm going to start at verse 38. So it's chapter 31 of Genesis, starting at verse 38 and reading through 42. Now, Jacob is talking and he's and he's talking to Laban because Laban caught, you know, was chasing him. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was. By day the heat consumed me and the cold by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. But God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. But God... Now, Joseph, we're, we're fond of talking about Joseph as a scoundrel, and he was a bit of a scoundrel. <laughs> but Jacob, excuse me, not Joseph. Thank you, Dan. Um, Jacob was a bit of a scoundrel. But Laban was more so. Now, they were related, so it was probably a family trait, I'm sorry to say. But Laban was the bigger scoundrel. He was just... He cheated Joseph, he held or Jacob, he held Jacob back. He wouldn't let him accumulate wealth. He wouldn't let him free. He wouldn't let him advance in his life. He, he practically had Jacob there as, as a slave. And he didn't treat Jacob very well and he wasn't honest with him and he, and he wouldn't allow Jacob to prosper. Now, I thought to myself, I thought, wow, Dan and I have been in the position more than once in our long ministry where we have been, my word for it is hobbled, where somebody else has decided they're going to hold us back. They're going to lie about us. They're going to spread false rumors about us. And they're going to do everything they can to manipulate situations so that we are held back. It happens. And you know, it's really hard to go through. And I'm not going to give you specifics again because some of those people are still walking the planet. But it happens. And it can happen in your own family. This was Jacob's own family. It can happen in the church. It can happen just where you least expect it to happen. We all deal with old natures and stuff happens. It really does. But it hurts. And I remember that we went through a period of a few years, quite a few years, where we were just not allowed to advance and we were suspect and we were talked about. And it's incredibly difficult. And I remember I had a devotion from Oswald Chambers. I think it was in my utmost first highest, but I'm not sure. And he talked about, he said, now if God has you standing on, on a plain white square, in his whole picture. Don't try to color it in. He's got his reasons. Just occupy your plain square. And that helped me a lot. But here, this helps me a lot too to read Jacob um, being able to look at Laban and say, you meant it for harm. You really did. You cheated me. You held me back. You kept me practically a slave labor. But God, saw how hard I was working, but God saw the intent of my heart, but God was on my side, but God prospered me. And you know, if we can say that, we can get through anything. And it isn't necessary, in fact, we can't join the fray. Like they said this about me, I'm gonna say that about them. I'm gonna get people on my side. Oh, that's the worst thing you can do. You've got to just keep your mouth shut, and bless the Lord. But when you see that but God, you know he's on the case. 
he sees, he sees what's going on and he has my best interests at heart. And again, he's going to find ways in his own way, in his own time to prosper me and take me to a good place. Just trust him and keep your mouth shut. Let's go read one more thing here on chapter 32. It's the same story. Jacob is, is fleeing Laban, and now he's getting ready to meet his brother Esau, whom he hasn't seen in many, many years. And they parted company as enemies, and he's afraid to meet him again. He's afraid that Esau is going to take revenge on him, kill him, kill his wives, and kill his children. 32 verse 9. And Jacob's praying, and he says, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. So let's just pause there for a minute. Jacob, when he fled, Esau initially left his home and he journeyed to go to his relative Laban. Um, he went with a, a walking stick. He just, he just ran away. All he had was his walking stick. And he's come back, this huge entourage, basically an army. And it's, it's so big that he's had to divide it into two camps to, to meet his brother. And he's saying, I don't know how that happened, but God saw me. God was providing for me all this time in his own way, and here I am, somehow by God's grace and mercy, well provided for. He had become a wealthy man. Verse 11, Now, O Lord, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me, the, mother with my, the mothers with the children. Now here's verse 12, here's another one. But you, God, said, I will surely do you good. I will make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So again, when those fears mounted up and Jacob actually feared for his life and he feared for the lives of his wives and his children, his response, he prayed to that God would save him and help him. But he said out loud, but God, but God, you have said that you would do me good, that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and that you would that, that my, what does it say here? My offspring will be as the sand of the sea. So I guess I'm not gonna die today. <laughs> this is not the hill I'm gonna die on, God, because you said, but God. If we can learn to look adversity in the face, look at people who are trying to hurt us in the face, look at the situation, even if we are mistreated, abused, hobbled, lied about, held back. It's all irrelevant. That's just all in the eyes of man, which is irrelevant. <laughs> we can say, but God sees my affliction, but God sees my hard work, but God has promised to do me good and not harm all the days of my life, but God has a wonderful plan for my life that will result in his glory and my good, but God. We can get through anything going to take just one more. I think this is a short study today. I'm never sure. We're going to just take one more today, and that's Genesis 50, verse 20. This is one of the most powerful but God statements in the whole Bible. Now we've moved on to Joseph. Now, you know the story of Joseph, how his brothers left him for dead when he was a young boy, threw him down a well and left him for dead, and he was picked up and by traders, slave traders, and brought into Egypt as a slave, and eventually even went into prison in Egypt. I mean, Joseph had a hard life for quite a few years, but then was he promoted, and he became second in command in all of Egypt, and was actually the responsible one for saving the world in a great famine. Well, that's Joseph's backstory. But now here, his brothers have come to Egypt to get food, and they've learned that it's Joseph, and, and they remember you know, what they did to Joseph, and now they're scared, they're shaking in their boots. I'm gonna start reading, let's see, chapter 50, I'm gonna read it, verse 15, and read through 21. It's the most powerful but God in the whole Bible, I think, to me. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, 
They said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. I think they're lying. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, I know that you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Wow, there's a lot here. Um, but it all swirls around this phrase, but God. What Joseph understood about his life, and he, he came to that understanding, I think, during his years in the dungeon, because Psalm 105 has some very interesting verses about what God was doing in Joseph's life. And one of the things it says is that God was preparing Joseph to be a wise and good ruler in Egypt when the time came where he would be needed. But anyway, um, when and how it happened, we don't know, but God says, I did it. But God knew, or Joseph knew, that God had a deeper purpose in mind in all that happened to him. Think about that. The betrayal of his own brothers, the fright at the bottom of the well, the years as a slave, years in a dungeon. Um, somehow, he, with eyes of faith, he had come to understand that God had meant all of it for good. But God meant it for good. Not, but God was able to use it for good. I looked up that word meant in the Hebrew, fascinating. One of the synonyms given for it is plotted. God was plotting this thing for a good purpose. Isn't that interesting? We need to go farther and deeper in our understanding of the sovereignty of God in our lives and in the world. But anyway, Joseph understood and he was able to look back on a life of early life of sorrow and evil and rejection by his own family and say, but God, but God meant the whole thing. The whole thing was designed by God for a wonderful and eternally significant purpose. So I'm good with that. <laughs> and I can just forgive you and love you as your brother again. What a powerful thing. And the same in our life. It's the same in our life. Um, it's just a whole lot easier to forgive, isn't it? And treat people kindly after they've hurt you. If you understand that God is doing something with that, something important, something wonderful, something for his glory and for your good, because that's a promise. And you cannot separate God's glory from your own good, not as a child of God. Every single thing that happens to you from the day you come to Christ until you get to heaven, everything is for his glory and your good. And when we understand that, when we can look at Rejection, sorrow, mistreatment, bad memories, that's a big one, memories that hurt, and say, but God, we've got it made in the shade with lemonade, we really do, but God. The facts don't become unreal, like we said, I think the last time, I'm not sure, marriages are made in heaven, but lived in Pittsburgh. The facts are real, and we have to deal with them, but when we understand God is in the house, that God means it for good, that God has got control of my life, that he's taken me to a wonderful place, that doors will open and doors will close, that people who've hurt me will be rebuked, by the way. We read that one in the case of Jacob, remember? <laughs> I like that too. In God's timing, he will rebuke those who hold us back and hurt us, and he will prosper us. We just need to trust him. Keep our eyes on the invisible God and trust. So the next time you're hurt, you're bewildered, you've lost control, um, fill in the blanks. Everything we've looked at today, because it still happens today to God's people. Oh my goodness. Remember that phrase and say it out loud, but God. And you will see new strength coming into your life. 
Well, that's all for today. And next week, we're going to continue with But God with a few more wonderful examples from God's Word and applied to our own lives. So until that time, this week, start practicing that. Any time that these emotions or situations come up and you start to panic a little bit, and sometimes I think I have a panic disorder, I really do. Oh well, another story for another day. Respond by saying out loud, but God, but God is in the house. And see if it doesn't help you walk through in victory. So until next week, bye.